So hi everyone, my name is Krista McGarry. As I mentioned, I'm a data scientist first, but I'm also our industry CTO for financial services, helping our financial institutions really transform their AI journey. Now, something you should know about me is I don't like to sit up here and talk alone, so I will ask you all some questions. So if you don't want to participate, now's probably the time. If not, I'm not going to call anyone out, but uh, we, I want to make this as interactive as possible. So on that note, just to get started about who we have in the audience today, can you just raise your hand? How many people are in the banking world? OK, some banking, financial markets, insurance. OK, what am I missing? Students? Yell it out. Travel, Travel? OK. OK. All right, perfect. So it's, it's predominantly banking. So we'll, we'll talk a lot about them banking here today, um, but I'll touch on some other industries as we go, because there's a lot of application that can happen, happen across and not just in banking alone. So let's go ahead and, and jump into it. So with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, digital transformations were accelerated. So rather than thinking about years um, to, in order to get things digitized, it was reduced down to weeks. And this was with more people calling in through the contact center, either consumers or merchants or institutions. But it was also people who were, had complaints and needed help. Maybe they uh, were unemployed and so they had to rethink their loan options. Or maybe they saw the low interest rates and wanted to refinance their mortgages. Um, but despite that, there's still a tremendous amount of opportunity to transform the industry we know today. So we see things like augmenting the customer experience, improving operational processes, and lastly, we want the money, uncovering new revenue streams in order to capture those new markets that are emerging. But despite these new areas for opportunities for AI, the core of banking and financial institutions still remains the same. And that's one, customer management. Customers at the core of everything we do, every decision we make, we want to have the customer in mind. The second is around our products, so be a savings account, checking account, a policy for auto insurance, making sure that we have the right products that meet our customers' demand. And the last one is risk mitigation. We're a highly regulated industry, we all know that, so how can we manage it and ensure that we have the right compliance in place to help um, our, our audit teams be more proactive and, and bypass some of those different processes that, that can be pretty overwhelming. So the first one on the customer management side. So have you heard of like customer 360, customer 720? I don't know how much like more iterations we're gonna go, but I like to think of customer of one. And this is being able to know your customer completely, gather those different data sources, and understand that as things are coming in, you can reach out to them. So something we can all relate to, hopefully you have some sort of insurance policy. Could be car insurance, home insurance, whatever it may be. Imagine that you got into a car accident, you file your claim, and you receive response instantaneously. Wouldn't that be cool? I would like that. But we all know that doesn't happen, right? Usually there's a review, and you have to be you know, potentially escalated to surveillance, because maybe you were flagged fraudulent, even though you're not, and so that can take some time. But there's opportunities for AI to really make that happen. Now, part of that is being able to gather as much data as possible ahead of the accident even occurring about you. So here's a little quiz for you guys. I wrote down the stack because I think it's pretty powerful. What percentage of insurance consumers do you think would like to share their personal data for a lower interest rate? Yell them out. What percentage of consumers would want to share their data, be driving data, health data, whatever it may be, for a lower interest rate? 80%? 85? 90? It is 69. 69%, and even more interesting, in the past two years, that has gone up 20%, which means that people are really willing to share their information if it means that they benefit it. So when I get in that accident and I file that claim, you should already have all my data. You should know I'm a good driver, and so you don't need to escalate me over to the surveillance team to make sure that you know, I'm not fraudulent or whatever it may be. And so that can help improve it faster. Um, this is also about having those models in real time. So maybe there's a risk calculator that says, okay, you know, Kristen's not that risky. She seems to be a good driver. She's from New York. I don't know. But uh, maybe she'll be okay. So, you know, stuff like that can help reduce that timeline for decisioning. Now, complaints management. Uh, again, with the pandemic, lots of complaints coming in. I made a few calls. I'm sure you guys made a few calls, regardless of what it was. And so it's important to be able to, regardless of how our customers want to interact with us in the contact center, we have the, the ability to detect those complaints, be text analytics on top of it, sentiment analysis, call routing, 
to make sure that those people get the decisions they need quickly, because the last thing you want is a pissed off customer, right? We want to make sure that we are able to solve those, those quickly. Now for our um, non-consumer facing ones like onboarding, institutional onboarding. So this can take up to a year to get institutions onboarded. That is really bad, right? So by the time you go through the year, you're probably thinking, well, why did I do this, <laughs> right? Maybe that's, that's when they see their highest attrition rates actually, because you go through the whole process and you're like, why was that so painful? What's gonna happen when I'm actually onboarded? And so it's important to look at some of those capabilities of how do we speed it up right out of the get-go to provide that personalized experience. Now on the product side, um, this is all about rethinking the products we have. So we've got our traditional core banking, savings, checkings, lendings, et cetera. Uh, but we also want to make sure that we're expanding to new innovative channels. So we talked about the digital transformation earlier and how more and more companies you know, want to make sure we're having digital interactions. Um, but we also tend to think that if you would think of a generation gap, right? We've got our Gen Zers, our Millennials, all the way up to our baby boomers. There's different levels that they want to have when it comes to digital interactions. Some are like, I never want to talk to my bank. <laughs> Let me talk all through a chatbot, and I'm perfectly fine with that. You've got others like my 94-year-old grandma that's like, I know my branch manager. I want to go talk to them. Screw the app, right? I want to do everything that way. Now, here's another quiz for you guys. So thinking of our Gen Zers. So these are 1997 to 2012. So let's say under 25. What percentage of those with smartphones are using online banking? 98, 100? 80, 80%. 80% of our Gen Zers who are already on their phones on TikTok or whatever it is these days are also using online banking. So we want to make sure that that's there for them. Now if we go to the other side of the spectrum, I won't make you guess this one because this one's a little harder, but US boomers, so you know, our, our post-World War, those um, with the COVID-19 outbreak, 46% of US boomers went to a new digital channel. So we tend to think those older generations don't really care, but they do. And so we want to make sure we can provide that off for that product subset that meets their needs as well. Now, other options, next best action. This is a big area in the product space. If I know someone is a, um, I, maybe I service their mortgage, I also want to be able to offer them a savings account to help pay for said mortgage. So being able to cross sell and upsell within the bank. And part of that is having that customer of one information so I can make an educated guess about what they might be interested in. Uh, default is another huge one, uh, credit decisioning. This could be lending, this could be even insurance. Sometimes you have to get a credit risk. But being able to do those decisioning faster and making sure they're unbiased. Now, I, I don't know how many of you were in the presentations before this, but the number one topic today is trustworthy AI, right? We hear it everywhere, everyone's talking about it. And credit decisioning is at the heart of that. How can we ensure that there's no bias against age, gender, ethnicity, race? whatever it may be when we're making said decisions. And we'll talk a little bit about guardrails in place in order to make that happen. Now the last one here, we talked about risk mitigation. So this is really around how can we ensure that we have the right compliance, the, nice, the right rules and controls in place so that as things come up, we're tracking them and we can also mitigate said risk. My favorite use case here is what we call cognitive controls. This is, I don't know if we have any compliance folks, CROs or GRC, if those acronyms mean something to you, hopefully you're in this uh, compliance world. But this is around, okay, we've got a new regulation coming out or things we need to follow, be like the Fair Lending Act, and we want to have the right risks and controls in place to help manage that. Now, let me look at the risk. It's all just unstructured text. Let me do some text analytics on it and being able to dissect it into the who, the what, the when, the why, and where. And if I can't do that, then that control is not robust enough. So an example of where we can use AI to make things more efficient and flag ones that might want to be updated. We said trustworthy AI, obviously hot topic. Um, I'll talk a little bit about today, but we're going to focus more on model ops. There's a bunch of other IBM discussions if you want to go deeper about every single component of that today. But we'll keep it on the financial services lens. Now all of this to make it happen, you need that curated data layer with internal and external data. So right now, if you're only in the internal world, start going external, because a lot of your competitors are, and it's one way to gather a lot more information about the individuals you might not be able to get before. And then lastly, you need the end-to-end -end governed ML ops platform or model ops platform, which we'll get to in just a second. Okay, so it's all important. We think it's great. Obviously, we're here, so we think innovation and AI is important. But what's the holdup? The reality is that data science business impact is being delayed by lengthy model ops cycles. 
And there's business challenges and operational challenges that are preventing those things from taking years down to days or weeks or even months like we're trying to achieve. Now, it starts with a business challenge or a business KPI they're wanting to address. So they might say, in uh, retail, how do we stay competitive against emerging fintechs? Right, they're everywhere. How can we make sure that we're providing that same experience as a better.com or you know, something that's coming in? Maybe we're flagging too many claims as fraudulent, high false positive rates. It's like 101 of the fraud world, right? We want to make sure that we're not over flagging people by getting more high quality and concentrated individuals. Um, my favorite is, do we trust our models? <laughs> How do we know that we are, that, that it, as we hand it over to the marketing team and say, hey, Joe Schmo should get an offer for a checking account, that we're providing explainability, and they feel comfortable making a decision based on that to do something about it. Now, the operational challenges, I'm, I'm sure your organizations have a lot of different ones. It could be that your teams use too many tools. We worked with one I'll talk about in a second where they had probably at least 50 <laughs> different data science tools from IBM's Watson Studio, SageMaker, Python, R, whatever it may be, and they were all using their own shebang. So it makes it challenging to maintain, but also to collaborate across the different teams since they're using different subsets. It could also be your CICD process is not correctly in place, and so it makes it a little challenging. Or honestly, the number one operational challenge I hear is we're just not communicating. Right, people, it's not data scientists talking to data scientists, but maybe data science isn't talking to the business, business isn't talking to the CTO, and it all just makes a, a challenging mess. So communication is key. Now the strategy to help bring this all together is really around, you know, how do we deploy from months to, to days as we talked about, but it's about how do we think about AI at scale and speed with some of those processes to collaborate with it. Okay. So our approach is what we call the AI factory approach. And we like to keep, keep it simple, three Ps, not the three Ps you're thinking of in the banking world, but people, platform, and process. And bringing these all together can help bring that governed AI life cycle that we're seeking. Starting with people. Uh, this is really around getting the right roles and skills throughout your organization. Uh, building out a COE is becoming kind of the preferred choice when it comes to how you want to structure your, your company. Um, but it's also about having those different skills from data scientists, the visualization team, business, et cetera, that we talked about. Uh, process. So we'll, I'll, I have a process diagram in just a second we'll go through. But this is around using design thinking, agile methodologies, go back to our software development days, where we can have the right things in place so that as we move down that factory line, we have a feedback loop and we're capturing updates and people are handing off things correctly. And lastly is platform or technology. So having an end-to-end -end platform where things connect together that is agile enough and open enough that people can use the tools of their choice and they don't feel constrained, but also not too open that we can't manage it and it poses a risk to our organization. Okay, so here is some financial institutions that are seeing real impact. And you know, this could be, imagine your company logo up here and some of the things we could achieve together. But the first one I want to point out is, I mentioned earlier, you know, a team was using 50 plus different tools. That was this multinational financial institution, probably the largest. Um, they have 25,000 analysts, citizen analysts, data scientists, quants, statisticians, you name it. And they were all using different tools, which made it really challenging to manage it from a risk standpoint. And so for them, we're on phase two of a three-phase rollout where we're adding our tools and our process and people in order to have a, a streamlined manner for them to interact. So for example, we have um, what a product we called OpenScale, which is managing each model and saying, hey, what is the likelihood of this being biased? Uh, is there data drift? Is there concerns in model accuracy? That's in the back end. It alerts as things come up that seem a little fishy. The next one here, this is a US regional bank. Um, they had an existing wealth management retention model. Very smart data scientists, they were very proud of it. Um, but they had no way of managing it. So as it got put into production, they didn't know if the data was drifting or if the model accuracy was declining. And so it made it challenging for them to say, let's put that, that in production if we don't know what's gonna happen. And so what we did with this one, we did a six week engagement in six short weeks. We took their pipeline, which was built in a, actually Azure, and we added our capabilities on top of it and was able to monitor data drift, put it into prod, and now it's mon monitoring those mission critical decisions. So just another example of how you know, bringing this methodology together can have real impact. Next one, uh, this is one I personally have the joy of working with, Highmark Inc. or Highmark Health out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, brilliant you know, PhDs in the healthcare space, have been neuroscientists, physicists, whatever it may be. 
Um, but it took them 12 months. <laughs> it took them a year to go from the idea of a model to actually getting it into production. We're able to do that down to six weeks using the agile methodologies. And the last one, uh, multinational retail corporation, obviously not an FI, but uh, fair hiring. They had a problem as people came through the hiring portal, they found that there was bias against gender. So you know, men were tending to get more offers than women. So they wanted to make sure that they didn't eliminate that variable, because there's some stuff you might need to know about it, but they were balancing the weights differently so that both men and women were getting equal opportunities. You could think this similarly to race or ethnicity, right? There's a lot of other factors that come up when we're doing some of these fair hiring. Okay, so now we're gonna zoom into that process. Remember I said people, platform, process. This is the process that we typically follow when it comes to implementing an AI governance or an AI strategy. Now, obviously, this is a lot going on, but the first thing you should notice is there's a lot of heads. <laughs> there's a lot of people that are collaborating when it comes to this effective process. Starting from, you've got the business, the analysts, the data scientists, engineers, et cetera, and they're all working together cyclically to help achieve this overall goal of having an AI-governed solution. Now, some things I'll point out here is we'll start with the business goals, but really, you could start anywhere, right? Depending on where your organization is, you can plug in where you're struggling the most. But starting with the business goals, one of the key best practices when it comes to model ops is planning and designing. So I don't know how many of you have took like a coding class, but in Python 101 or Programming 101, the first thing they do is they hand you a piece of paper and a pen and say, write down what you're gonna build, right? You don't just go to the computer and start typing it out. And that's because you know we can build something out and it could be great for us, but then maybe we didn't plan for something else or we didn't handle an anomaly that much came in and so we're gonna have to go back to the drawing board. So not only is it important to design, but it's also important to include other point of views in that design. So everyone is inherently biased, right? It's part of the, the human decision process. And so my experiences might blind me from someone else's experiences who has seen something else. So it's important that you know, in our diversity and inclusion efforts, we're hearing other voices and we're getting as well-rounded of a decision so that when we're building it out, we know that we're you know, representing the right groups or we're watching out for any, any biases that might emerge that we might not be fully aware of. Now, the next thing I wanna point out um, is we talked about the collaboration but if you see the bottom left, your feedback loop. So modeling, train, evaluate, deploy, and monitor. I think we all agree a feedback loop's important, right? Yes? Okay, good, hopefully, hopefully it's a yes. <laughs> but the reality is uh, we usually don't have one, right? We're deploying models and maybe someone's going in and manually checking how they're doing or doing some A-B testing, but there's usually not one embedded. So it's really important that we're capturing that feedback as we're going through the process and making sure that that model is either being updated or retrained as new data points come in. The number one example I think of this is, you know, with the COVID-19 pandemic, any model trained before 2020 probably, you know, plummeted when it came to March because it's on new data points it's never seen before. And so it's important we're retraining those models for new anomalies or outliers that might occur as things come forward. And then the last thing I'll point out in terms of best practices, if you look to the top left, visualizations, dashboards, um, business goals, it's important we're communicating to our business. They are the end users of said models that we create, and we wanna make sure that things are explainable, understandable, so that as they actually implement them into practice, they know what's going on. So you could think of maybe I am an individual that's sitting in the contact center, and someone says, hey, this person, um, can go ahead and uh, bypass surveillance because X, Y, Z. If I'm gonna make a decision on the call and say, hey, this person's not, it's not a fraudulent call, I wanna make sure I understand that because if it is fraud and I said no, go ahead and pass it, well then I'm in trouble, right? So it's important that we understand and we help communicate how things are being created, even you know, knowing that everyone's not a PhD data scientist roaming around that knows all the ins and outs of the statistical model. Okay, so that was process. The next is platform. So obviously this is our platform. Um, there's a bunch of other platforms that connect into this that you, know, you can imagine kind of putting yours on here. But this is the IBM Cloud Pack for Data Approach, which is an end-to-end -end governed platform available on any cloud. So part of our, our hybrid methodology, I'm sure you guys have seen you know, all the ads and whatnot that are flying out there, is that we can connect anywhere. So on-prem, off-prem, regardless of what your clouds, so we're pretty vendor agnostic from that standpoint. But having, you know, regardless of the platform, having an end-to-end -end governed platform allows the different groups to connect together so that you have that complete process. When you have people jumping from platform to platform and product to product, 
makes it more challenging to manage and it makes it more challenging to, com to communicate. So some approaches I see is, well, you know, we want best of breed and we want every single niche product. Sure, that's great. You know, that you, there's a lot of best of breed here as well, but you're going to be too niche and it's going to be really challenging to get that whole model ops process we just flew if you have too many independent parts. So just something to keep in mind there. Um, the other thing, as I mentioned, compatibility. So one big thing that we're pushing is with that one multinational institution that had, you know, 50 plus different tools, we're not saying, hey, everybody get on Watson Studio because that's just not realistic. So being able to connect and open to other platforms, BUC, Azure, and AWS, and whatnot, all those models can still be monitored using our capabilities like data drift, accuracy, and whatnot, but they can build where they want. So that makes it a little bit easier for them to collaborate. So that was more on the platform. Um, one thing I do want to call out is technically when we think of technology, we usually don't put an industry lens on it. Now, coming from the financial services world, I always think, you know, what are banks doing? What are insurers doing? But not everyone thinks like that. And so as part of that, we have started creating what we call industry accelerators. And these are intent assets that are built off the most common business use cases that we tend to hear over and over from our financial institutions clients. So things like credit card default, loan default, uh, small medium enterprise lending, reinforcement learning, et cetera. These are some of the top areas that tend to come forward. And a lot of these have a trustworthy AI lens embedded. So we can take the credit risk. This is an example where it's a lending process. We are saying whether an individual should be flagged as risky or not. And we have a debiasing algorithm in the background that's making sure there's no bias for age or gender when it comes to making said decisions. Um, another one you can look at is loan default. This is one that I actually had the pleasure of building out with our, our team in, in New York, actually. And this one was looking at, can we predict loan default 12 bounce out, but only using transaction data? So typically, we look at things like payment history, uh, length of loan, principal remaining, et cetera, when it comes to making some of those decisions. But solely on that transaction data, we were able to get a higher accuracy of whether someone was going to default or not. And again, same debiasing algorithms in the background that are messing with the weights to make sure we didn't have any bias when it came to making said decisions. So just another thing to think about when you're trying to build out your platforms. Now, the last he piece here in our three Ps is people. So I mentioned earlier about the COEs, so kind of building out a COE. Even if you want to keep your data scientist siloed by line of business, totally fine, right? Maybe you have your lending group and you've got your marketing group and whatnot. It's still important they communicate. So having them collaborate together, even if they're not physically sitting together, sitting together, right, <laughs> in, uh, in the organization. So that's exactly what we did. We built out what we call the elite teams. And this is a series of data scientists, data architects, engineers, visualization experts that solely focus on proving impact fast. So you can think of this like a tiger team or a SWAT team that comes in and in six weeks proves out how you can either build a model or take that model and add the right governance metrics on top of it. It could also be, hey, you know, my data is everywhere. Help me come up with a plan on how I'm going to get it all together to get that customer of one or customer 360 view. But just something to think about, you know, as you're building out your teams, really having the joint stack, different teams collaborating together, and thinking about quick, tangible outcomes. Um, based on a lot of the executives I talk about, I don't think many people are making three-year decision transformations anymore. You know, like, you know, five years ago, it's like, oh, we're going to move to the data lake, and it's going to take five years, and it's going to be fantastic, and it's going to cost us billions of dollars, or even the mainframe if you go way back. So it's really about quick wins, prove value, then scale. So thinking it down to, to that little nugget. Now, the last thing I'll leave you with today before we um, enter into some questions here is um, a lot of people don't know this about IBM, but IBM is really doubling down in the machine learning and AI space. And as part of that, we are actually one of the leaders when it comes to AI governance. From our IBM research team, which is one of the top contributors to not only publications like scientific research, but also one of the top contributors to the open source community. So you can actually Google it now, IBM um, Explainability Toolkits. You'll see a series of six toolkits that are available um, on GitHub that you can play around with. It'll show some of the initial metrics that we use when it comes to managing the, the trust of different aspects. Uh, leader in AI platform. So our solution is a leader in the magic quadrant, uh, which we're very proud of, and it's continued to enhance as we get customer feedback throughout the years. So another thing we'd love to, to play around with. 
And then the last thing is we actually have an IBM AI ethics board, which I think is kind of cool, um, where we're actually advising on policy. We're, work we're working with European regulators and other groups to advise on how things should be done um, based on the feedback that we're hearing real time from our financial institu institutions and beyond. So with that being said, you know, we talked about a lot today, uh, model ops, trust for the AI, AI governance, and how we can really Im impact it for our financial services clients. I'd love the opportunity you know, to connect with each and one of you and learn more about what you're trying to do and see where we can partner together to really help achieve some of these AI transformations that we're all wanting to seek. So with that being said, thank you, and we'll open up for questions.